Good morning church. This is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice in him. What a privileged people we are. We are not alone. We are with the family of God. What a blessed people we are because Christ is the head of the church and we are the church. We have one another. Not only we are connected to Christ Jesus but we are also connected to the people of God in our church. What a beautiful symphony that we see in the body of Christ. This morning while I was reading the scripture a beautiful passage just came to my mind. Paul is writing in 1 Thessalonians to the church how we should be living together in the body of Christ. I want to read those verses to you. It really blessed my heart. I hope it will be a blessing to you, not only a blessing, but we will practice what is spoken here in the word of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 12 to 16. Now we ask you brothers to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. Verse 14 And we urge you brothers warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and to everyone else. Verse 16 Be joyful always pray continually give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus Friends God is calling us to be an encourager God is calling us to help others God is calling us to be kind to one another God is calling us to pray for one another. God is calling us to be thankful. God is calling us to be joyful. God is calling us to be like Christ. What a privilege that we have that we can be Christ to somebody. We can have the nature of God and demonstrate the nature of God. That is the church. Supporting one another, encouraging one another. enabling one another so that we all can reflect Christ Jesus with that i want to welcome you to this worship service where christ is the center of our worship he is the head of our worship and he is the center of our worship as we join the worship team let's sing joyfully and proclaim the wonders of god and tell the lord how beautiful you are how loving you are how gracious you are and we want to praise you let's praise the lord i'm trading my sorrows i'm trading my shame
61 verse 10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself, like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels.
Father, we thank you for this blessed time where we can come together to praise you, to worship you because you are the King of Kings, you are the Lord of Lords. Lord, what a privilege people we are because we are connected to you and connected with one another. As we rejoice in you, as we continue to serve you and serve the people of God, help us to be an encourager, Lord. Help us to help others. Help us to support others. Help us to pray for one another. Help us to walk with others who are really struggling. Give us the grace and help us to be a blessing. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Friends, again it's our privilege to study the Word of God. God has brought this book Nehemiah into our midst so that we are not only studying the Word, but we are getting prepared to rebuild the lives and rebuild communities. Even as we listen to the Word of God by Reverend Adrian, let's ask the Lord to tune our hearts so that we will be strengthened in Him so that we are not disturbed, we are not distracted, but we will continue to do what God is asking us to do. There will be challenges, there will be struggles, there will be hindrances, but may the Lord strengthen our heart, strengthen our hands to continue in the mission of God. Brother Adrian. I greet you all in the wonderful name, the sweet name and the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is a pleasure and indeed a privilege to join with you once again as we look to God's Word. God's Word which is our foundation, God's Word which is our strength and God's Word which is our helm. For His Word is truth and we rely upon Him through His Word. As we continue with our book study of Nehemiah, we are going to look today at Nehemiah chapter 6 verses 1 to 9. Nehemiah chapter 6 verses 1 to 9 and the title of my sermon for today is Fear and Faith. Fear and Faith. Now text for today is taken from Nehemiah chapter 6 verses 1 to 9. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks left in it though at that time I had not hung the doors and the gates that Sanballat and Geshem sent to me. Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. So I sent messengers to them, saying, I am doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? But they sent me this message four times, and I answered them in the same manner. Then Sanballat sent his servant to me as before the fifth time, with an open letter in his hand. In it was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem says, that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you are rebuilding the wall that you may be their king. And you have also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah. Now these matters will be reported to the king. So come, therefore, and let us consult together. Then I sent to him, saying, No such things as you say are being done, but you invent them in your own heart. For they all were trying to make us afraid, saying, Their hands will be weakened in the work, and it will not be done. Now therefore, O oh God, strengthen my hands. In our previous study from the book of Nehemiah chapter 5, we looked at how Nehemiah overcame the internal challenges he faced through his fear for the Lord and his sincere compassion for the people of God. In chapter 6, we find that Nehemiah is faced with external challenges that fuels the intensity of conflict just as the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem was nearing completion. Nehemiah is faced with destructive distractions perpetuated by Sanballat, Tobiah and Gershom who oppose Nehemiah's efforts. They use the net of distraction, false accusation, fear and intimidation to abort Nehemiah's plans. Sanballat, Tobiah and Gershom failed to obstruct the Jews in their work and now they used a different strategy to distract Nehemiah from his work. 
just as the work was coming to completion, Sanballat and Gershom the Arab tried to manipulate Nehemiah four times to meet at a place called Ono. And four times Nehemiah refused with full knowledge that they intended to do harm, distracting him from his purpose. The invitation seemed friendly, but Nehemiah could discern that they had suspicious motives and they meant him harm. What kept Nehemiah headstrong was that he understood the significance of his work, for it was a great work not for any human but unto the Lord. Therefore, Nehemiah knew that any interruption would not only distract him, but also stop the progress of his work. Still finding no joy in manipulating Nehemiah to abandon his work, Sanballat, still pretending to be his ally, came up with another scheme. In a letter, Sanballat accused Nehemiah of sedition by saying that he wanted to usurp the king and make himself the king of Judah in rebellion against the king of Persia. So Sanballat's scheme was to supposedly help Nehemiah to avoid trouble with the king, so he wanted to get together to discuss the matter. Firstly, Nehemiah knew that Sanballat's wicked schemes were false and these false accusations were meant to harm him. Nehemiah refused to give in and again proving his loyalty. Nehemiah, through God's wisdom, was able to identify the false accusation, expose the source of it and motive behind it. The pretense of working together to meet for a solution showed the cunning, deceptive nature of Sanballat. The narrative appears for us in the text just before Nehemiah chapter 6 verse 9 where we read, They were trying to frighten us thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. We have for us principles in which we can glean from this very verse in conjunction with our narrative and that is all about fear. And faith. Let's talk about fear. Verse 6 begins with the words, They were all trying to frighten us. We all have many fears. Fear is based on the uncertainty of life and the volatility of how episodes in our life may pan out. The fear of the unknown drops us into a place of despair and ignorant assumptions. Our life is filled with many fears and it pierces us to the deepest part of our souls. And the fact of the matter is that none of us can escape the reality of fear. Fear also comes from many enemies that lurk around us, that distract us from our relationship with the Saviour. The enemy of insecurity that measures our strengths against the strengths of others. The enemy of pride that prods us to please man rather than God. The enemy of self-sufficiency that says we are self-made and can accomplish anything on our own effort. There are many foes that instill fear in us, but the greatest fear remains the fear of fear itself. Many of us cannot say that we are so strong that nothing can bring fear upon us. Yet many of us are like the touch-me-not plant that cringes and curls at the slightest thought of fear. Fear, my friend, only makes us unhappy, robbing us of joy and keeps us in the place of pushing us to give up and fail. It interrupts us, disrupts us, and corrupts us to the point that nothing makes sense anymore. Fear gives birth to misery and we remain in that place and we continue to fear. What are the causes of fear? Nehemiah was faced with real flesh and blood enemies whose very purpose in life was to instill fear in Nehemiah and his companions and to further distract them from the purpose which God had called them to just as Nehemiah had flesh and blood enemies that caused much fear we may have many enemies of the soul that plague us the enemies of the soul that are alive and real today they become obstacles in our lives that make us afraid. Firstly, in the scriptures, we find that the devil is our adversary or enemy who goes about like a roaring lion, seeing whom he may devour. 
Today's society has reduced the devil to a mere myth of ghoulish man with a tail and a large pitchfork in his hand. The devil is not just a myth, but real and a great enemy that authors fear in our lives. The devil is a downright enemy which brings forth great fear that we are not able to do anything. Secondly, the enemy of our soul that brings about fear hide themselves in people around us. As in our narrative today, we find that those who hinder the purpose and the plans of God are our enemies. Such people bring fear upon us because of their opposition. They also distract us away from God through unprofitable relationships. People who constantly put us down, hurting us by their words and actions. Such people hinder our walk with God. Stay away from them. People who do not profit us in growing in our relationship with God. Keep away from such people. After all, the scriptures warn us not to be unequally yoked. Thirdly, our sinful nature within us is the enemy. It has been commonly said that you are your worst enemy. We all have been born with a sinful nature. The word of God tells us we all have fallen short of the glory of God. And that sin constantly lurks at the doors of our soul. We either respond to open the door or we keep it shut. As we've seen, these are the enemies that plague us and bring us fear. What are the effects of fear? Firstly, fear exaggerates the problem. Fear brings exaggeration of the problem. Fear makes us perceive a problem larger than it actually is. It inflates the outcome and exaggerates the consequences. Do you remember the days when we were young and we were told that when we swallow a watermelon seed, we were so terrified into believing that a watermelon tree would grow in our stomach and burst right through. Recently, studies have shown that people who have arachnophobia, that is the fear of spiders, the greater the fear of spiders, the bigger they perceive the spider to be. In reality, a small spider can be thought of as being huge because fear exaggerates the problem. In other words, the fear of the spider has warped the perception of the size of the spider by the individual. Another term associated with exaggerating a problem is called catastrophizing. This blows circumstances and situations out of proportion and leads to overthinking, negative thoughts, anxiety and depression. Another effect of fear is the loss of strength. Fear can grip you to the point that you feel paralyzed. There is no strength to face the fear head on. It leaves you helpless and hopeless. Fear keeps you lodged under the rock of weakness. You will find that you have no joy, no drive to push forward and no strength because you are overcome by fear. In Nehemiah chapter 6 verse 9, the latter part, Nehemiah says, But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. Nehemiah had found faith to replace fear. To be strong, you must be courageous, and to be courageous, you need faith in the source, God, who is our Heavenly Father. Psalm 56 verse 3 states, When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. Now let's move from fear to faith. Now faith is the antidote for the venom of fear. When we take our little faith and put it in the hands of the Father, that little faith becomes great faith. By faith we mean that we trust in God and that He will do what He says with certainty and we do not trust in the uncertainty of human achievement. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 states, And without faith it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Despite all that Nehemiah encountered around him, he was sure of his faith and whom his faith was in, the living God. 
the effects of fate against the effect of our enemies, let us know that God is real. Faith stands in opposition to fear. As we face the many enemies of our soul that surround us, faith opens our eyes to see more clearly that our God is real. When fear binds us to the comfort and consolation of the assured presence of God in our lives, faith opens our eyes to see that God has never abandoned or rejected us. In 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 15 to 17, we have a great illustration to show us how we should see God and not just our enemies. Let us read the passage. 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 15 to 17. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my lord! What shall we do? the servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Verse 17. And Elisha prayed, Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and the chariots of fire all around Elisha. Like the man of God who prayed for his servant to have his eyes opened, let us believe by faith that God would open our eyes and see his presence within us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8 expresses for us, But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Against the effect of fear, let us have the spirit of hope. The hope of salvation will stun all fear in our lives. Salvation is the assurance that God will save us. The certainty that He keeps His word. Our hope is based on the fact of the certainty of God that He would keep His promises and not on the uncertainty of human achievement. Therefore, when we come to the place of being hopeless, God gives us hope. I want to share with you a principle that will not only help you to come to a place of hope, but will help you to sustain yourself in hope to dispel all your fears. I want to give you a principle to help you to sustain hope to dispel your fears. And that principle is, remember your past experience of God's help in your lives. Remember the help of our God in the past. Remember the help of our God in the past. Have you ever looked back in the past and looked at the challenges that you experienced and think, how did you manage to overcome those challenges? Beloved, it was only by the grace of God and the hope you had in Him that He brought you thus far. It was again in the certainty that God would keep His promises and not in the uncertainty of human achievement. We all can recall wonderful testimonies in which the Lord has been most faithful in our lives. His presence with us and His help for us. This, beloved, is one way in which we replace our fears by recalling how the Lord has helped us before. And this leads us to knowing our experience of God's help. Like Paul, we can look to the Lord with confidence, knowing that He has promised us nothing would separate us from His love. This is the hope that keeps us from our fears. Romans chapter 8, verses 35 to 39 reads, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors to him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Indeed, like Nehemiah, from our text today, he endured bitterness, jealousy and false accusations to frighten him, destroy him and to push him away from the purpose of God. We too are faced with enemies both internally and externally that endeavor the same. But we can pray with confidence, Now therefore, O oh God, strengthen my hand. And that prayer helps us to replace our fears with faith. What a great consolation! What hope! What relief we have that we can go to a God who is able to support us in our difficulties and He is a good God, a loving Father whom we can go to with faith and in prayer. It is through God that we can receive grace to silence our fears and strengthen our hands in the midst of our enemies around us who are working to weaken our hands. We do not have to despair for in our warfare, God is with us and He will strengthen our hands when we have a duty to fulfill His purpose in our life or when we stumble upon conflict that can be overwhelming or even confront a temptation that is too difficult to handle. We can pray the prayer that Nehemiah prayed. Now therefore, O God, strengthen my hand. Trust in 
Let us pray. Our gracious God and most loving Father, what great joy we have in Christ Jesus who has removed every fear from our lives, who has removed the wall of separation, that we can draw closer to the precious bleeding side of Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are greater than our greatest fear. You have conquered fear upon the cross, the fear of death, the fear of dying, the fear of sickness and the fear of shame. You have taken away the spirit of fear and given us a spirit of love, power and a sound mind. We thank you, O Lord, that today we don't have to let fear overcome us, but we can stand in faith in you, in the certainty that you are able to keep your word, in the certainty that you keep your promises, O Lord. Father Lord, what do we have to boast in this life? Nothing, Lord, save for the great grace that you have given us through your Son, Jesus Christ. And I pray, O Lord, for all those who are listening today, that you will bless each person and keep them in your love. I pray, O Lord, that you will guide them. I pray, O Lord, that you will bless the activities of the week that's ahead of them. And I pray that each family that's represented here will be safe in your peace. Let your peace be with us, O Lord. In times where we do not have peace, let us experience your great peace and the joy that comes in knowing that peace. We pray and ask this in the mighty name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today and I pray that you will join us once again as we continue with our study of the book of Nehemiah. Even as you leave, may the blessings and the peace of the Lord be with you. Receive the benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide in each and every one of us. Grant to us grace, grant to us the faith over our fear, so that we may live and fulfill our purpose in Him till that great and glorious day we see Jesus Christ face to face. Amen. Thank you. The Lord be with you. Have a victorious week.